If you're after fluid motion in After Effects, the value and speed graph are two of the most important tools you should know. So today I'll show you how they work, what they each bring to the table, and then I'll jump into a demo and show you how I'd use them together in a real project. All right, so here we have a text layer rotating from zero to 45 degrees, then back to zero. Just some regular linear keyframes looking real trash. To check out the value graph, we're gonna click the rotation, and then over here, we're gonna click the graph editor button. Then down here, just make sure you have the value graph selected. So this is it, this is where the magic happens. Well, not yet, because linear keyframes suck. Over here on the left, we can see the graph showing us rotation degrees over time, so it's looking exactly how we'd expect it to look since linear keyframes move at a disgustingly constant speed, so the motion between the keyframes are a straight line. So let's go ahead and fix that and also make the value graph useful at the same time. So we're going to select all of our keys and then hit F9 to ease them. If you didn't already know, easing makes the motion accelerate out of a keyframe and decelerate before it hits the next one. And we can see that on the graph as well because instead of just being a straight line from keyframe to keyframe, it rounds out near the start and end and becomes more flat. Now that we've eased the keyframes, we can actually get into what makes the graph so powerful. When you select a key, you'll see that two handles appear on either side of it, and these handles actually let you control the motion's curve from keyframe to keyframe. This gives you an insane amount of control over how your motion looks and feels, like it's a game changer. And here's an example of what I mean. With just four keyframes, you can create a really clean looking swinging motion. Let me just quickly take you through how I made this curve. This initial peak right here is just a regular eased keyframe that I made wider by dragging out the left handle. If I turn it back into a regular ease keyframe, you'll see that the motion still works decently. So why did I even bother dragging that handle out? Well, by dragging it out to the left, I essentially gave the motion more time to decelerate before reaching 45 degrees. And I did that for two reasons. Now the rotation stays at its peak just a little bit longer, and that makes the text feel a little bit heavier. And also it made the top speed of its windup faster. If I were to drag this handle all the way in, I would remove the deceleration, but I'd also make this line a lot less steep. Notice the difference in time it takes to go from 10 to 30 degrees rotation. So here the motion is telling us it's going to accelerate, get pretty fast, and then have a long time to decelerate. And again, all the way in, it's telling us we're going to accelerate into motion and stay roughly the same speed, which is a lot slower because the line's less steep, and then it's not going to decelerate. So the reason why the graph was helpful for this portion is because by dragging this handle out, it gave me a faster initial windup, smoother deceleration towards the peak, and it helps sell the weight of the text better by lingering on the peak longer. Now let's move on to the next keyframe, the one that controls the overshoots. You might be wondering why I have a keyframe in the middle here instead of doing this technique on both of these overshoots. Over time, I just found that it's easier if you let the keyframe handles do the actual hard work of making these curves themselves, rather than you having to create keyframes here and here, and then having to adjust four handles to create the motion you're looking for. Now for the last keyframe, I just dragged this handle out a bunch to have a nice smooth deceleration. One thing to note here though is that I held shift when I dragged this handle out so that I didn't accidentally drag above or below. If I did do that, I would be creating small over or undershoots that would ruin the deceleration of this ending curve. If I were to add another in though, I wouldn't be using this last keyframe to do it, because while the motion coming into this last overshoot would be pretty smooth, I'd be guaranteeing an abrupt end. Instead, I would just add another keyframe in, maybe right here, and then I would make this my deceleration ending one, and here this would be the new overshoot. Okay, we spent enough time on the value graph, so now let's get to the speed graph. The speed graph is a little less intuitive to read, but it's actually really useful as well. Here we can see if we pop in some linear keyframes and take a look, we have a big, dumb line. But on the left of the line, you'll see that we're no longer working with values, we're working with speed. So here we see the linear keyframe is performing exactly as expected, it's exactly as disappointing as we knew it would be, and it's moving at a constant speed the whole time. But if we go ahead and select our keyframes and then hit F9 to ease them, we see that this also tracks. We know that ease keyframes accelerate and decelerate out of motion, and here we can see that the start and end speed are both zero. The go-to move for me is usually to pop open the speed graph and drag one of the handles depending on how I want the motion to go. If I want the motion to start fast and then slow down, I'll drag the handle on the right to the left. You're kind of just offsetting when the peak of the motion happens. And by dragging that peak to the left, we're making it accelerate a lot faster and have plenty more time to decelerate, so it looks really smooth. This one handle technique is so powerful because it gives your motion a lot of character and it's just ridiculously easy to do. If I'm opening the speed graph instead of the value graph, 90% of the time it's because of this. And also depending on how far you drag that handle, you can make it a lot more subtle if you want to. If you want to take it a step further though, you can drag both of the handles in the same direction. Since I dragged both handles to the left here, I'm getting really, really smooth deceleration, but the start is just jarringly abrupt. 
I recommend not really going this route unless you have something in your head that's really specific and you know you want the motion for, like a bullet leaving a gun. Well, actually, that doesn't work because it wouldn't slow down like that. I mean, like, I guess a bullet leaving a gun and entering jello, maybe. One way I do actually use it, though, is if I'm animating something on or off screen, because that way I can hide the abrupt part of the motion. For the example up top there, the abrupt start and end is covered by the fact that it's out of frame anyway, so you just see the smooth part. And like for the bottom example, it doesn't look bad or anything, but if the motion doesn't warrant the look of something snapping into place, probably don't go with it. But if you do want a snappy look, there you go. And you can get the same motion with the value graph too, but the only difference is with the speed graph, you're dragging one handle, and with the value graph, there's a few extra steps involved. Because the value graph can only deal with one dimension at a time, if you got something like the position or the anchor point that has two dimensions or more, you have to separate them first. After you separate them, you just have to adjust both of the keyframes handles. So I mean, it is doable and it is pretty fast still, but the speed graph's just faster. All right, so now let's get to a proper demo because I wanna show you how I actually go about using these graphs together instead of just explaining how they work to you. So to start off, we have this nice little cabbage farmer guy, you know, pointing to his prized cabbage, or so you think, but what he's actually pointing to is his pet ladybug. And we wanna show that in an interesting way. So the first thing I'll do is just go in and delete all of the rotation keyframes so it's easier for us to focus on the position motion for now. And we already know we're gonna be using the value graph later, so I'll right click the position and separate the dimensions right off the bat. Now you may have noticed that this is a 3D layer, and it's because there's this weird behavior with scaling in After Effects, where if you animate the scale of something to be really big, like over 300%, you'll notice that the bigger you make it, the slower it actually looks like it's growing. I have no clue why it works this way, but I do know how to get around it. If you make the layer 3D instead, and just animate the Z position to get closer to the camera, you'll get exactly what you're looking for. Anyway, so now that we've separated the dimensions, I'm going to delete the last keyframe on the X and Y positions because they won't be overshooting like the Z position will be. Then we'll grab the first keyframe for all the positions and head over to the graph editor. Since I want the whole motion to start with a slow zoom that gets faster as it goes, we can just use the speed graph's one handle technique to get us most of the way there. Now after that, I'd pop over to the value graph and add the final touches for the position. But looking at this, we're going to have a real hard time adjusting the graph because that initial zoom was so huge that we can barely see the value changes for the bounce back. This button down here is the reason it's hard to see. So if you ever face the same problem, this is the easiest way to handle it. What you need to do is keep auto zoom on, then using this top bar up here, adjust what's visible on the graph so that just the portion you want to see is there. The auto zoom should be scaling it so that it's a lot easier to see now, and then once it's a good height, disable the auto zoom, and then use the same bar to reposition the view. Alright, so now we can actually design the type of overshoot that we want. What I'm going to go for is something that's sort of elastic-y, and it's going to linger on the overextension before pulling back. So just by looking at the graph, I can tell that this motion isn't happening organically here. It's kind of heading down to that overshoot point, and then more or less heading right back. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select that overshoot keyframe and drag out the right handle so that the acceleration out of the overshoot takes longer. And now I'll select the last keyframe and just drag that handle out too so that it decelerates as it gets to its proper position. So I'm pretty happy with the motion we have here for the position, so now let's move on to the rotation. I'll just quickly add those base keyframes back in at 0 degrees, then negative 95 for the overshoot, and then negative 90 for the end. Now we'll give it the same speed graph treatment by using all the keys, then selecting the first keyframe, opening the speed graph, and dragging out the first handle all the way. Now hopping back to the value graph, we can get fancy, but first we have to do that graph height trick we did before. Sweet, so watching this animation back, I want the rotation to peak just after the zoom peaks. So I'll select this overshoot keyframe, and I'll drag the right handle down so that the graph line peaks even lower and later. And just so you don't have to guess when you're doing this stuff, it's a good idea to move the playhead over to the rough area of the new peak so you can see how far you want to pull that handle away from center. And uh, now that we've done that, we need to adjust the left handle of the keyframe too because we need a smooth graph for smooth motion. So we got to drag it so the handles are roughly in line with each other. And before I forget, I'll just drag this end handle in also for a smooth deceleration, and there we have it. One more thing for those of you who are observant and saw this little corner peeking out. A quick fix for things like this is an effect called CC Repetile. You just throw it on the layer and then you can expand it in whatever direction you need to cover any gaps that you have. There's a bunch of options in the dropdown for how you want to expand the layer, but the most useful one is usually going to be Unfold. That basically just mirrors the layer into whatever direction you expand it in. And since the top of the photo is just blurry green foliage, you don't even notice it's being mirrored, so it's perfect. If you made it this far, thanks so much for watching. I hope I was able to help you out, and I hope you consider subscribing.
This happens to be the first video that I've uploaded on the channel, so if you're sitting there like, hmm, I like this, but it's a bit of a gamble to subscribe to this guy. Well, first of all, let me say, wow, I really respect how careful you are with your subscription feed. You're very organized. That's really, that's great. That's great. But a pretty good counter argument is do it, do it, do it, do it, do it. 